I'm a real deal. I'll shoot your liver out and hand it to you. Where's Johnny? That's me. Oh. Well, that was pretty easy. You're, you're an easy guy to find. Huh? I thought I was going to have to go searching for a little while, but here you are. There you are. Sounding semi-willing almost. Mm-hmm. I'm here. <laughs> well, Johnny, welcome to the Cue It Up podcast. We've been chatting for a little while trying to get you on, and you know, you're just a busy guy. You got the golf, and you got I don't even know what else. You're just all over the place all the time. I uh, hear you. I'm, I'm, you know, I stay, stay still once in a while. Yeah, now you're here. I got you to stay still long enough so that I can chat with you and everybody can hear your lovely words. Wonderful. Doesn't that just sound great? That sounds just, just perfect. All right. Well, let's just jump right into this interview because it's going to be a blast. Johnny, you have been playing pool now for, what, close to 35 years, something like that? How did you get your start um, in the game of billiards? Well, I started whenever I was a young man, um, small town Georgia. We didn't have a whole lot to do, so one summer, me and my friends decided to go play video games at this little store. There's only one little store in town, so... Um, we got up there and, and, you know, summer's three months. So, uh, you know, it's, we always pick something to do during the summer, whether it be play baseball or basketball or this year it was video games. And, uh, we started playing anyway, the, they didn't ever change the games out very much. So we got real good at them and bored. So, uh, they had a couple of pool tables in the back and we went back there and played a couple of games of pool and, and, uh, I was hooked from then on. Well, how can how can you play pool when you got video games as an option? How'd your friends get you away well, from the video games? Well, uh, we got bored with them because uh, they just didn't change the games out in the store. So uh, we just they only had a couple games, so we just got bored with them and decided to go back to back and play pool one day in the same store. So that's what we did. And how old were you, give or take? I was uh, twelve. Twelve. And when did you start playing, let's say, uh, serious pool, so tournament pool? Uh, I joined the tour when I was 17, played my first pro tournament. So um, just from then on, probably. But I was playing pretty good before that, about a year, year and a half. So 15, 16, something like that. Ah, that's crazy. Three years. Woof. You're, there's a few other players that you could put in the argument as the, the greatest American pool player of the last 20, 30 years. Uh, but you cannot make that list without having Johnny Archer on it for sure. And you can make a pretty serious argument that you're at the top of that list. You've had uh, several world championships. You've been the player of the decade. Uh, you, I mean, you've pretty much done just about all there is to pool. But let's let's take a step back. Is there anything in pool that you still see out there and be like, that's the one, you know, that's my white whale. That's the one that I wanted that I was never able to get. Do you have uh, any sort of... A tournament out there that uh, is like that. Um, I don't know. Probably not, definitely not in the last few years have I thought much about that. But uh, you know, I was all, I always look forward to the Moscone Cup, and of course, winning the U.S. Open um, was a big dream of mine. You know, so so probably just big tournaments. Nah, probably, you know, I'm probably okay. Yeah, and you've you've won a lot of obviously huge tournaments you've you've won yourself a u.s open you've won a what six turning stone classics you've won the the world nine ball you've won you know what pretty much you've won just about everything out there at one point in time or another so which one of those do you think was the biggest uh staple to your career which is if you were to write an obituary on you know johnny archer's career what is the first title that's that's named I would have to guess probably, in, in my view, probably the U.S. Open. Um, just being from America and, and that winning that one, that's always a big dream. So uh, winning that one was very uh, – because I'd come real close two or three more times before that and couldn't get it done. So that was a big – that was kind of a big uh, big deal for me. Yeah, you have actually a, 
a remarkably good memory when it comes to matches and individual shots and stuff like that. Are, are there any matches in that actual event that you can look back and remember on and, you know, stood out for one reason or another? Well, uh, probably, my well, probably the finals when I played uh, Jeremy Jones. Um, you know, the score, I was ahead, you know, three or four games, had the match in hand. Um, the table was not breaking easy at all. We were breaking from the box. and It just, you know, a little tighter pockets that year. So it wasn't that easy. And then, uh, I don't know, he won three or four games in a row and come back and tied it up at seven. And then uh, I come back and won the last four games to win it. So that was a, that was a, just a good hard fault match. Yeah, and obviously Jeremy's a, a phenomenal player and, a, and another staple in American pool over the last few years. So so let, let's go back to, I guess, uh, going into your career. You've predominantly been more known as a tournament player throughout the course of your career, uh, but you still have plenty of gamble in you. You've done a lot of gambling uh, throughout your career. Do you, What is uh, probably your, your most uh, proud win in the gambling scene? Um, I don't know. I never, uh, the top players, we kind of always stayed away from each other, um, gambling. Um, but I did play boost of money a match, uh, the one time and, uh, had a lot of, you know, ran the, ran a lot of the racks in that set. So that one probably stood out, uh, even though I lost money in it, uh, in the session, but, uh, it probably stood out to me, um, that, but I, I gambled a good bit. I guess, um, you know, up until I just decided uh, one time I was going to have to choose one way or the other, either to play on the pro circuit and and concentrate on the tournaments or still go around trying to gamble. And I just, you know, I enjoyed the winning with the crowd and everything like that. So that's kind of what I focused my time on. Oh, come on, Johnny. You can't just say the Bustamante thing and brush over it. Something crazy happened in that match. You want to tell the story for it? Well, uh, yeah, I got beat. I <laughs> lost money. That was a crazy part of it. But, uh, 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 well, I, I ended up running the set out in the second set. That was, uh, and we're not talking a race to four. Good... This wasn't like a race no. to four or anything. This was a, like a race to 11 and you ran the set? Uh, it was a race to 13. A race to 13 and you ran the set out. I ran the set out in that one, yeah. And that was uh, back when we all broke the balls hard. So it's a little different run out than the way you do it nowadays with, with uh, breaking the balls easy. But, but yeah, it was a good one. It's, uh, you know, everything worked out. Racks, I kept getting a shot on the one, and I was making it and running out. It was uh, good times. So in a gambling race with Francisco Bustamante, you break and run a 13-pack and still lose money in it. That That's... That, I did. That's a wild story. I did. I did. If I was, uh, if I had it to do over again, I would probably had quit after this. After I run the set, uh, just so we'd break even. But uh, I didn't. I was uh, my my backers were kept wanting me to keep playing, so I did. And, and him being such a tough player, man, it was just uh, he hung in there hard. Well, that's that's an interesting uh, statement that you made there because. I do look kind of as uh, Francisco Bustamante as as being not necessarily the last of your generation of players. I shouldn't say your generation of players in the sense that you guys are done, but Francisco Bustamante really is still out there on the on the grinding scene, and he's really still playing a lot of pool at a at a pretty high level. Uh, going back to your generation, uh, right? Really, I guess the the early '90s to the probably the 2012 2013. Uh, who do who was your least favorite person to match up against in that time? Um, well, he was definitely one of them, if not the top. Uh, he was so hard to play against. He, uh, you know, he, he just had all the, you know, all the firepower for what you needed, and his break was so hard and and everything. It was just um, he was very difficult, man. He could always make a tough shot, especially when it came down close to the end of the match, and. Um, you know, he just made it very hard on everybody. Um, there was a few. I, I mean, you know, I was always scared of playing Buddy Hall, you know, because I always thought he was the best player I played. So um, him and um, I don't know. I, that's pretty much it. Them couple guys always, 
you know, Earl would always put a fear in you because he, he played so fast. It so could always beat you real fast. That was always my fear was uh, when I played Earl, just, you know, hope if I could get by the first 15, 20 minutes of the match without him being way ahead. And I usually had a pretty good chance after that. <laughs> so that was always a, that was always a scary part there, but you know, over the, over the years, all the top guys were just so hard to play against, but that's what made it, um, made it that much sweet whenever you did win. Yeah. I guess growing up, you said you played your first pro event when you were 17 years old and back in that days, uh, was, was pool still on ESPN or was there anywhere for you to actually watch uh, pool content out there in the world? Um, pretty much. The only time, well, the AccuStats, Pat Fleming was was very uh, helpful to me because I always got videotapes and I bought pretty much every match I could on the VHS back then. And I mean, uh, I still got a good many of them, I believe. But um, uh, that was always a big thing for me because I got I bought everything I could and, and watched everybody and studied them a little bit and just kind of tried to draw a little bit from all the top players. Uh, that's kind of an interesting thing we have right now uh, with with this generation of players is you can go to YouTube and you can watch just about any single video that's ever been made in the world of pool and you can watch any single player. You have different camera angles to break down their mechanics, you know, to really study their games. But that wasn't available really to you as much as, as a young man trying to learn the game. So I, I guess I'd like to have your thoughts a little on this generation and their ability to uh, really learn the game from, you know, YouTube and uh, Facebook to a lesser degree. Basically, you you can get content anywhere. So, I, I wouldn't mind having your ideas on uh, on what that means to this new generation of players. Well, I mean, the, the, like you said, they have the uh, they have everything at their fingertips right now. With you know, having to just pull up online at any time and watch a player. Um, you can watch players when they when they didn't play well. You can hear good commentary. Uh, depends on which match it is, I guess. Um, so yeah, you can, you can kind of watch all of them. My advice would be just to watch all the top guys and just try to draw something from, from each one of them. And then, uh, you know, try not to mimic, you know, that's where I see guys or, or players try to get involved. They try to mimic the other players while I want to play like him when you really just can't. And it's just not possible. I mean, that's why I say take every take something from everybody and and just kind of uh, you know mold your own game around you know and, and that would make you the best you can be, I believe. So when you were buying these uh, videos from Pat Fleming and watching all the pool content you possibly can, is that something that you did as well when you were younger? I sure did. I was a, I was a pest man. I was a <laughs> I was a pest around the tournaments and. All the top guys see me coming, man. I had to go to dinner with them. I had to sit there and talk with them and agitate them all the time, man. I tried to ask questions, and uh, you know, I just learned from from all of them. And and you know, each one there was something that they did great. Well, they did everything great, but um, there was something they ex- they always kind of excelled in. And I I just tried to, like you said, just just draw everything that I could from the tapes. And I loved watching them. I just love, you know, love watching pool and watching uh, what they did. And um, I think that really was a big help to me. <laughs> if, you, if you're willing to give up some of that, what, what were some of the things that you learned from each individual players? Because we have a, a pretty decent array of listeners to the podcast. Some of them are older, some of them are younger. But I, I think there's a lot of names in here that maybe people haven't heard for a lot of years that I think that uh, it, would, it would be nice to kind of dust off some of the archives for. So uh, if, if you're willing to give a couple of the things that you learned from individual players, I think that'd be a really neat thing. Well, something that I was always um, intrigued in was just watching players' routines and kind of, you know, um, what caused them to, to, to be great um, under under pressure. That's what I always tried to learn is is how what could I do whenever the pressure really got on and it was, school was real close toward the end and, and uh, all the anxiety was there. You know, what could I draw from it to, to you know, be better just a little bit in that in that instance? And, you know, all the guys, I mean, Buddy Hall, I mean, of course, I think Buddy Hall had the best cue ball control of all time. You know, it didn't ever, never look like Buddy ever, you know, was had to shoot any kind of a hard shot. 
But but then the thing is, if Buddy did have to shoot a hard shot, you know, he made it. So uh, he didn't mind playing aggressive. He didn't mind playing safeties. Uh, didn't uh, didn't ever. It didn't matter to him how the match was going because that was to me that was how, you know, I could judge and see what the, who the greats are is, uh, you know, how can they win with with this with how the match is going because all matches were different, you know, uh, some of them was fast paced matches and just kind of all run and gun matches or some was real slow. You had to play a lot of safeties because of the way the table was played. Um, back and forth. Um, some of them, you know, where one guy went five, six games in a row, then the next guy come back and went five or six games in a row. So it was always uh, different, different kind of uh, levels where the match went. And Buddy, to me, could win from from any kind of level. Didn't matter how the match was played. Didn't matter, and and he could run out toward the end. And I think it was because if you'll watch him, he just did everything the same or close to the same, his routine, you know, his, you know, his, his approach to the table, you know, his thinking part, he, uh, he kind of all did it the same. And I think that, that caused him to not have to use near as much energy toward the end of the match. And that's what I tried to mimic and try, try to do it toward the, especially toward uh, the last 15, 20 years myself. Yes. So that's actually a little interesting because, uh, if you look at different uh, aspects of Johnny Archer's career, there are actually significantly different playing styles for the different eras that you played in. I've seen you, especially recently, you, you kind of almost not quite the Earl mentality where you just kind of sprint around the table and just shoot balls in like it's like, you know, like like you have to get to a meeting or something. Uh, but but you play very quickly at, at times in your career and you've also played very slow and methodically. Uh, mm-hmm. is there any reason for the different changing of playing styles in your career or is it just kind of, uh, the flavor of the week with you when you're playing? Well, I, I think it was more, uh, just different, you know, different times in my career that I played. I think, uh, you know, like I said, probably, probably 20 years ago, I was playing much slower, uh, as I did the first, I don't know, the, the, the first 10 years or whatever. So that was always, um, uh, you know, a big change. But it was more, it wasn't like I was, you know, trying to, you know, I was, that was, that was what I would wake up trying to do. It was just, uh, you know, it was just different, different parts. And, and I went through years of I was playing a certain pace. And I know uh, early in my career, I, I kind of played a lot faster. I see some of the old match. And then um, as the 90s and everything went on, I started getting a lot, good bit slower. And then, you know, I'm probably play, playing a you know, kind of average speed now, you know, maybe, maybe a little faster than, uh, than I normally would, but, um, yeah, just kind of, it's just kind of the way matches were. If the, if there was a, if the matches to me, if it were really a lot of safety play and a lot of thinking, then of course I'd play a lot slower during that match. But if it was a run, kind of a run and gun match, you know, I'd, I'd be a good bit faster. So, um, you know, I, I guess kind of had to, how the match was going, I would play a little different. So I think the person that you naturally get compared to uh, most frequently, I think, is Earl Strickland. And that's because you kind of, your kind of peaks overlapped each other. And there for, a, there for a while, I mean, if you take Efren out and Francisco Bustamante out, uh, if you just looked at American pool players, if you didn't see Earl Strickland's name at the top, you saw Johnny Archer's. And that's pretty much the way pool was for about 15 years when it comes to American players. Uh, you guys have developed a little bit of a friendship, uh, obviously, from playing with each other all these years. Think back to the one moment where uh, you gained a respect or maybe you gained a little bit of anim- animosity towards him or whatever it is. What is the most memorable moment you have from playing Earl throughout the years? Oh, Lord, we have a few. Um, we, uh, we, we played man, mainly through the 90s. You know, we were back and forth, uh, winning tournaments and, and having to play each other a lot then. Um, I don't know. It just, uh, uh, I mean, I remember one, one time when we were playing partners together. We, we only played, I think, twice on the Moscone Cup. We only played together in a match, uh, only twice, I think, during the whole time. And I think it was just because of our, personalities what they we didn't match up good together um 
But um, I don't know. I, uh, some matches against each other. Um, there was definitely some good ones. Um, I played. I see. Uh, I think I played him. Played him in the semifinals of the World Championship one year, and, and uh, we, it was a real good match, real fast match. Uh, we played on ESPN. And then I uh, just. Uh, well, I don't know. I remember we we got into it a few different times early. Um, <laughs> we got into it a few Generally times where speaking, we, that happens. yeah, <laughs> and uh, you know that was kind of a you know it's kind of a, a sad thing to think about, but but it, uh, I think it it made for more respect from both of us um, with the other one. And, you know, we just, as, as we got older, you know, we started doing a lot more shows together, um, a lot more exhibitions and stuff. So we got, got a pretty good friendship going. And, um, you know, I think girl's a great guy. You know, I think he's definitely misunderstood, but, you know, he's brought a lot of the heartache and pain on himself. I could be it, but, but I think, uh, you know, he's just well misunderstood. He's, he's, um, you know, I think he's a genius on the pool table. And if you talk with him, you can, you can hear that. But, um, you know, we, we've had some good times. It's been, uh, it's been not all, not all bad, but, um, definitely had some rocky times too. So if you take the totality of your entire career of playing against him and you take up every single match, every single game, do you think that you got the edge on him, or do you think he has the edge on you as far as overall record against each other? Um, I think we're probably pretty close. Um, I might have a little little bit the, the best of it right now, just over the records and everything, because uh, because we we played mostly in, in the nineties, and that's whenever I had just a, a great ten years there. So I probably uh, had a little bit the best of it there, but you know, overall, now we have, we're pretty close. Yeah. So, all right. One interesting thing you said, you and Earl actually only played twice together in the Moscone Cup. That mm-hmm. that might kind of go over a lot of players' heads when they're listening to this. But I think you've made the Moscone Cup uh, 12 times or four, no, 14 times. And I think uh, Earl Strickland has made it uh, 12 times. So you guys have been overlapping a lot of time. I mean, you guys have probably played played at least 10 Moscone Cups together throughout the years. It's it's actually kind of a, a shock that you guys have only played together twice. Well, actually, I think Earl played 14. I think I played 16 times. But we, uh, I've only, there was only one year, I think, that Earl played on that I didn't play with him, that I wasn't on the team. So, yeah, we've, we've had to play on, uh, on teams together, you know, many years. We led the team a few years. Um yeah, it was just uh, I, I tell you, the first time we ever played together was back in the, I think it was the late nineties. Uh, that put me and him and I played against. Uh, I think it might have been Suke and Orban, I believe. And if I might be mistaken on that, but um, we were playing, and back then uh, wasn't scotch doubles. It was just you're playing part of, so you'd shoot till you miss, and then uh, you know you alternate who breaks. So it came down, and uh, I was playing. I had a bad match. I wasn't playing well. Earl was playing great. And, I mean, he held us in um, the whole match, and it got down to heel heel. So the way that way that it was format was if it got to heel heel in the match, uh, your teams relagged. And then whoever won the lag got to break the last game. So that was kind of different the way they did it. Um, so we got up there, and I lagged. And I won the lag. I think it was against Suke. And then uh, I looked over Earl. I said, Earl, ah, come on. You know, he every time he, he was breaking and running out, like every time. And he wouldn't, he, he was staring in the crowd. So he wouldn't look at look him. And I said, Earl, what are you doing? He turned back around. He said, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to shoot. You got to get up and play. I said, man, I'm playing horrible. I said, come on, you're running out. Come on, get up there and run out. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't get up. And I said, oh my gosh. So the pressure was intent and it just uh you know it, it was kind of the way it was at the time and so luckily enough i got up and i broke run out and uh won the match and i was i was i didn't understand back then i was a little upset because he wouldn't play but i understood where it was he just you know uh, he didn't feel like he could break run out that last match so um he felt i think i had might have won the game before so um, I don't know he the momentum or something, um, and he was that was very smart at what what he did. I didn't understand it at the time, but uh, but I do now. That's really interesting. He and 
anybody who knows Earl Strickland, of course, knows how he likes to, we'll just say, uh, get into it with the crowd for, for lack of a better term. Uh, yep. and he was, he was kind of staring off into the crowd. Uh, I'm sure somebody was heckling him a little bit and I'm sure he was probably letting it get to it maybe just a little bit, but after playing poorly the entire rack that he just handed it off to you that. Uh, yeah. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, him, him and I talked a little bit about it. We've only spoke about it a couple of times and, uh, we talked a little bit and I, and I still, to this day, I was trying to figure out why would you, you know, want me to shoot, play the game, and and uh, you know, and then why didn't you get up and play? And he just said he he didn't feel as confident right then as in himself as he did me. And I said, well, boy, I tell you, I was a dead opposite. I said I I had the confidence in you, and I didn't in myself. And uh, I don't know, he just he he just didn't feel like he wanted to get up and try to play. He felt like it was best for the team if I did. And, um, you know, I, I, I still, uh, still would like to sit down with him and talk to him in detail with it a couple of times. But, um, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of, uh, it made me feel good. He had the confidence in me, but it, it kind of made me a little upset that he didn't have the confidence in himself. But, you know, I understand, uh, the Moscone puts a lot of, a lot of pressure on you at certain times and, and um, it is sometimes when you're out there, you, you, you'd rather be any place else but right there. <laughs> and that is maybe something. So uh, I, I believe you are the second most frequented player in Moscone Cup history. If I'm not, I think Mika Eminen might have um, maybe just a couple more than you. And I'm, I'm making numbers up basically in my head right now, but I, I think that's the case. Uh, if I was wrong, you could tell me on that. But. Uh, you're you're the most for any American player. I know that for sure. So if there's anybody who can talk about the Moscone Cup and its evolution throughout the years, there's nobody more qualified than you. So you played in this basically basically from the beginning. Not uh, where have you seen the Moscone Cup evolve from its inception to now, kind of where it is today? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know if I you want me getting started on that, but um. Uh, <laughs> Probably, um, you know, my opinion is, is, is the, the Moscone Cup has lost a little bit of heart, um, you know, over the last few years that, that you know, because I still watch it and I'm a big fan. Um, I think it's it's just kind of, uh, it's not approached the same way as as we did go all together. Me and Earl and all was on the team coming up. Um, that's just kind of the way I see it. I mean, I'm, uh, I think it's been great that the America's won the last couple of years. I think that's great. It keep keeps everybody in the ball game. So, um, um, you know, I, I I think it's more of a a little bit. You know, I definitely miss it. You know, I'd I'd love to be playing there because it was always my favorite event every year to play. But um, you know, I I it, it I think the resurgence of the Americas the last couple of years has, has been a big shot now on board so i think it's good the few years before that yeah it kind of went down big time in my my view um i mean some of the old old um you know staples that like i said the people that was involved at match room you know that's been been involved uh through it that i've seen so many years they're not there anymore um you know and that's just you know it just don't it's just i know things evolve and, and and things kind of kind of going to the next stage but they just don't look the same to me uh and i was out there a couple of times when they played the last few years and i uh, didn't definitely didn't feel the same to me either um so i missed that part of it and i uh I, I know they'll get it back i know that but um it's kind of uh you know and then then with uh, the johan johan coming in coaching americans you know i thought that was just a spectacle even though you know of course he's the best coach ever you know and he showed it by coming in and winning but i still think that was just a uh you know kind of a spectacle um you know i never understood how you know the actual european coach coming coached the american so it kind of uh far as the the win you know what is still the players <clears throat> the players had to do it but it still wasn't the same it didn't feel the same um you know by them winning but you know this year with Jeremy Jones, I think they got a great coach there. 
definitely a great Moscone player over the years. Oh, yeah. You know, he was one of my one of my favorites that I got to play with. Uh, so I think he'll he'll take that and, and um, take it and, and see what happens this year. That ought to be uh, ought to be real interesting. I, I do want to move on to the Jeremy Jones things because I think that's a that's a good uh, that's a good avenue to take. But I do want to go back to one thing you said, and you said it's good to see us get back on the the winning trail in the last two years. This is this is pretty rich coming from a guy who beat up on Europe. Well, it's uh, you know, <laughs> of course, I'll be I bleed I bleed American blood every every year. So uh, you know, so yeah, no matter what, I'm always going to be rooting for America. Uh, and you know, we had our big run. We did for many years there. We done well. We was man, we had some stacked teams back then. I mean, uh, really did. It was just whoever you played against was was there to win and um man it was just tough beating us back then um but yeah i think uh definitely europe europe evolved you know they started really coming in they turned the tides there and they, they did pretty much the same thing we did for their many years so they did the same thing and uh, back to us and you know now it's it's uh you know i still see you know every year i still see europe has a little bit the favorite well whenever i look at the lineups but Man, America sure has um, showed some heart the last couple of years in coming out one, especially a couple of the younger guys won some big matches that really needed to. Shane stepped up there. Um, Shane kind of had a rough, uh, rough few years there in the Moscow. He didn't do too well, but um, last couple of years he's really, really stepped up as a leader. And um, of course, America needs that. Yeah, and, and I think that's a, I, I think that's kind of an interesting thing to talk about here because. Uh, the years that uh, Shane was really struggling was, you know, kind of 2012 to 2000 and uh, I guess 17, and there was one year in there where um, was it 2014 or was it 2012 where you went undefeated and the U.S. still lost. Was yeah, that-, that was 2012. Yeah, yeah. So 2012. So 2012. Remove 2012 because obviously you showed up to play that year. Uh, there, there was a stretch in there where it just seems like the U.S. just couldn't get it going. There, you know, there was a lot of eleven twos, eleven three, eleven four. That the U.S. was really struggling, and, and I, I, I guess when I look at that, I'm seeing players that the U.S. has always had their staple two to three players that are just, you know, they're just world class quality. You know, yourself, you have, uh, you have, of course, Earl. You have players like, uh, you know, back in the day, a little bit further, you have players like Nick Varner who are, you know, just really, really top tier players. And, and then Rodney Morris, of course, in there as well. You're always having these staples of really world class American professional players. And I think we kind of lack that a little bit, maybe from 2013 to 2017, where, yes, we still had our players that could compete at the world level, but they're not going to go into a U.S. Open and uh, really be the favorites pre you know pre match one there's there's just not going to be a lot of that necessarily but at the same time you see over in Europe that there are you know these these younger players just popping up out of out of basically nowhere you have you know your Joshua Fillers Fedor Gorst Eklanti Kachis uh and even like Max Leshner's players like this that are just seemingly coming out of the woodworks and every every other week we have this young player that we've never heard of who is now you know running six packs and winning uh, major world events. Why do you think that there is this disconnect between bringing up youth players in the U S uh, that we're struggling at? And why do you think that Europe is so good at doing it? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yes. I don't know if I got a, a real good answer for it, but um, you know, one thing I can always look at is, is the American, you know, especially the last few years, you got the American team. And and the the five that's on there uh, is pretty much the only five, um, you know. So so America only didn't have a whole lot to choose from, you know. They not a not a lot of numbers. Uh, Europe, I mean, I think there's 20 guys they can put a team together with, and um, just draw them out of a hat and play. I mean, I believe. Um, and I agree with that. And completely. I and uh, I think that I think that a lot of a lot of it comes up with. Uh, you know, with how they're, when they start playing, they take it so serious and, you know, and, 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 you know, then they evolve as a player and they get to go around and, and see each other, see all the top players at any time. I think America's so spread out 
you know, with how, how tough it is to travel. If they're not on, uh, say, on the East Coast, I'm on the East Coast. If I don't, you know, if they're not on the East Coast, I'm not going to see them very much. You know, um, and so, um, you know, I think that's that's a, a part of it. I think it's work ethic, too. I, I think the Americans definitely has been more of a lazy, uh, a lazy team, you know, as far as working. Um, I think Europe works harder for sure. Um, you know, uh, but, but still at the, at the end of the day, you, you know, you got a race to five and you're trying to win a match race to five, which is very short, um, uh, comes down to one or two shots usually at the time. And, and, uh, you know, America's done well the last couple of years, you know, for sure. Yeah. And so going back to the Johan point that you made, I, I think most people would say that the staple that Johan brought to the team was he brought discipline and he brought work ethic. I, th- I think when you ask most of the players who know you know Team USA really well, they'll say that he brought those two things more than anything else, which is the two things that you said the U.S. has been lacking. Uh, do you kind of see that as – do you see a change, I guess, in the U.S. team in the last two years as far as uh, those two, uh, I guess, characteristics? Well, I definitely see uh, – you know, I see the work ethic uh, for sure. He definitely brought that. And he demanded the camps. He demanded uh, the, the guys go to the camps. You know, I still am not a big fan of, of uh, that format. You know, what he done, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, but, you know, it worked. You know, it worked. Um, you know, but uh, I don't know. It's just uh, it's still even uh, even a couple guys I see on the team, <clears throat> I know they're not big workers, but they'll do it. They do it to, uh, you know, when Johan come along and that, that was what he was demanding that they did it. So, um, you know, I guess for the whole, for their full, full time, they're, they're not big work ethic guys. Uh, but, but during that they were, so that's where, that's when it really mattered when it counted. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's move on from the Moscone cup. Uh, but I, I think we had a, a pretty good discussion in there. Uh, so let's sure. move on to uh, Johnny Archer now. So we, we covered a lot of uh, Johnny Archer, you know, kind of up through the the the, I guess the the prime of your career, and you, and what some people that might not know is you you still are playing pool, and you're still playing pool at a pretty high level. So, uh, how how much time do you dedicate to the game? Let's say weekly now, as compared to when you were back in the '90s and early 2000s. Well, um, you know, one thing about me, even throughout my whole career, I never practiced very much. I was always playing. And so I loved to play. I'd play hours every day, but I was playing. I was always in little gambling matches or I was always in, you know, some kind of matches with somebody else, always doing something. I never was one to just go in and hit a lot of balls. I didn't do that. And, uh, definitely as I got older, I really didn't, don't do it now. But, uh, um, you know, I get to play, you know, I get to play a little bit here, there, and, you know, it, it, it matters to me. A little bit of play is a lot for me. So, uh, you know, as long as I can, I can stay kind of in the mix, you know, uh, a little bit of time is good for me. Um, I've always been kind of a lazy, lazy practicer. So, um, you know, getting me up to practice is, is hard, hard chore. Yeah. So what is, I, I guess, what does your career look like right now? Where, where do you see yourself in the broader world of pool? Well, I mean, um, still working on getting a pool room. Um, that's kind of going to be, you know, well, that's going to be my whole, you know, my whole focus there. Uh, and we're going to definitely we talk get, about that in a little bit. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, but I, I don't know. My career probably winding down. Um, I'm going to still play, you know, if I feel a resurgence coming, you know, and uh, probably, you know, getting a little bit of, get a little bit more energy coming out and everything. I, I might would play a little bit more, but, I can see me kind of getting to the point where I'm just not playing that much anymore competitive. And, um, you know, that, that's just kind of where I'm at right now. And, and, um, you know, I definitely always going to love the game. So I definitely ain't gonna never say, well, I'm just retired and I'm not playing anymore. You know, I don't know when that'll be, but, um, but definitely, uh, it slowed down a good bit. And I think this year with the COVID is really slowed down and, and, uh, I don't, I don't really see me getting getting back definitely following all the tournaments anymore. That ain't gonna happen again, I don't believe. Yeah, so I guess uh let let's go back let's take a step back uh to earlier when we were talking about Earl and you had made the uh statement that you two are actually doing little um 
I guess, get together slash uh, challenge matches, uh, signatures. You're, you're kind of having these, uh, I, I guess, little, you show up around the, the pool world and you just hang out at a pool hall all day and you tell stories, you sign books, you sign cue balls, you kind of just you kind of just exist in the world of pool and kind of take a, a victory lap for the historic career that you you have actually had. And you're doing this a little bit more now with Earl, and you actually might even be coming to Wisconsin in a, in a couple of months, it sounds like. Uh, so talk a little bit about what you're doing with Earl and uh, possibly where people can find you in the future. Well, I mean, uh, Earl and I, you know, we get along real good, so it's, it's always a, we're a good draw. And, um, you know, we, we're usually pretty fun to hang out with. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're going to always, you know, as long as we're able, we're going to always do a few things here and there together. And, uh, we're, you know, like, like I said, we have one coming up with Tommy Kennedy. We're going to, um, raise, raise some money for Tommy coming up here. Um, uh, I think it's next month here in Charlotte. And then I think we have one, like you said, going to be, we're working with Larry Neville. So, um, we're going to be coming, you know, there to Wisconsin, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be more um, this year. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to do a whole lot this year, but um, but definitely next year. You know, uh, I don't know. Just um, go to our Facebook pages and um, check them out. We usually always got something on there. So that's kind of what we. It'll be fun, fun time for you. You can hear some some stories that's uh, you know definitely for the public, and and then you're gonna hear some stories that probably ain't so good for the public. <laughs> yeah the the non the non podcast worthy stories that's right that's right there's definitely some 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 stories that'll be in my book one day in your book right all right so uh let, let's go back uh, a little bit more and uh, you said that you're trying to open up a pool room so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're trying to do there well you know as most people know you know i own Mary at a billiard club back in uh, here about three, three, four years ago. I had it for about 11 years and, um, you know, that one run its course. And uh, I've been trying to, to open one up probably just about since then. And uh, I'm finally getting to the point to where it looks like, uh, you know, we're a lot closer, definitely a lot closer to opening one up. And, and uh, I'm going to try to do some, some definitely some good things. I'm going to try to set it up in a way that I can do some a good bit of stuff with pool and um, I got some ideas of, of what I'd like to do with, with some team events that I'd like to do. So um, that's going to kind of be in the forefront of me setting up things, uh, bringing players in. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, we're just excited. It's going to be a good business. And, and uh, you know, I learned a lot from the last, from the last one on, on a good note or and on bad note. So um, hopefully I'll be a, a good bit better on uh, running this one. And where are you hoping to open this one? It's going to be, it's still going to be in the Atlanta area. Uh, uh, we're looking now, we're looking probably about 20 minutes from Atlanta. Um, and it's, uh, it's we're looking kind of in the Norcross um, Peachtree Corners area. If you're, if you're familiar with Atlanta, you'd know that. But um, uh, it's still in the Atlanta area, and I'm still Georgia at heart. So I'm, I'm excited to still be here in Georgia. Yeah, I think what what did Darren call you once? He called you peaches. Your peaches. Oh Lord, I ain't no telling what he called me. He don't speak good English anyway, so I don't know what it is. It's got to be that. It's got to be that bulldog accent he has. <laughs> yeah, I think so. You and Darren, man, you you two are buddies, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoy being around Darren. Darren's a lot of fun, and uh, he uh, I kind of give him to I kind of give him the needle pretty hard, and of course he he gives it back so. Uh, we're a good match, made in heaven, on as far as uh, <laughs> as far as picking at each other, pretty good. So it's, uh, you know, that that and that's still the one thing I, that I still enjoy doing. I still love to to go do things and be with some of the uh, some of the guys that, that we can just pick pick with each other and kind of pal around and and uh, you know it's still that good good bit of respect for each other. So that's that's uh, something that I think. Uh, has a little bit that been lacking the last few years that I've seen some of the young guys and all. I would like to see them do a little more of that. So I think uh, I'm actually going to have Darren on the podcast as well coming up. So maybe this can be a fun thing to just get you two riled up a little bit more. Do you have an <laughs> Do you have an embarrassing story that you would like to tell about Darren Appleton? Uh, Darren Appleton. Let's see. Uh, yeah, probably a pretty good one. Um, 
we, him and I went on the road doing some shows one time. And I think we was gone about two weeks. And, um, uh, we decided uh, one night was, I can't remember where we was at. Uh, of course we could have been in Nebraska. I'm not exactly sure, but, um, I don't know. We, we went to, we went done our show, um, had a good day, was working pretty hard there for five or six days in a row. And then we had a day or two off. And, um, the last night we did where we did a show at, we decided to sit there and start drinking a little Well, I'm not a big drinker, but evidently Darren is. So, uh, we started drinking and, and Darren really got, we, we started getting loud and just, who knows what we were talking about? There ain't no telling. But we decided to, they had to give us a ride back to our hotel. So we had another, uh, the guy that Mark Hentra that was doing, uh, putting on the shows for us or kind of, uh, he was, um, scheduling. So he went around with us. So we, uh, going back to the hotel and Darren had, was getting a ride from, um, the, it was a mother, it was a, um, you know, husband and wife that owned the pool room. So he was getting a ride from the husband. And so Mark and I was getting a ride from his, from his wife. So we're in, we're going, and right by our hotel was McDonald's. So we decided to pull up. Well, Darren, he took Darren over to the hotel that was right next to us where Darren seen us over there. It was about midnight, one o'clock in the morning or something. So here comes Darren. He wanted to get some food too. Well, well, he just started running from the, from the hotel. So we can see him coming. We're like, Oh Lord, he, he's drunk as he can be. So. He gets over there close to the where we were in line, where the drive-through line, where Darren's gonna come up, walk up to to the drive-through and order food. Where they ain't gonna take his order because he wasn't in the car. So he's yelling at them and, and anyway jumps in the car, dives in the car with us. And his feet's hanging out the window, and we're trying to <laughs> scream at him. Uh, we're gonna get called by the police or something, and they were gonna call. And, and um, then finally. Uh, he got to order some food. We, so me, him, and Mark goes back to one of our rooms, and, and we're having a good time. And Darren was so drunk that he was trying to eat the, the burger, and it was going all over the floor. He couldn't <laughs> keep it in his mouth. Then he had a milkshake that ended up going all over Mark's bed. Oh, my Lord. And him and Mark was going to get into it. Oh, I got to laughing so hard. It was so funny. <laughs> and I got a laugh. It was just one of the, and I know he don't remember nothing about it because he was so, so out there. Oh man. It was, but it was, that was definitely one of the funner times for me. You know, I enjoyed that. That's, that's pretty good. I, I yeah. we got to get this, uh, we got to get this one out to Darren now. And I can't wait to the, re- I cannot wait for the rebuttal. It's going to be a good hey, one. I want to hear his side of the story. See how, see how he remembered it. Yeah. <laughs> That that could that can happen. We'll have to get uh, we'll have to get Darren on here pretty soon, and uh, he can give us an embarrassing story of Johnny. And then, oh, uh, I'm sure he's got some. That's for sure. We might even have to get you both on here together, and we'll just uh, we'll just heck oh, you both God. and let you just yell at each other. Oh, that'd be funny. At that least this way, I, this way I'll be able to censor everything. So, you know, that shouldn't be too. <laughs> yeah, bad. that's true. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I think this has been a pretty fun uh, interview, and uh, so I guess the last question I have is. What does the future of Johnny Archer look like? So we talked about the present, we talked about the past, but uh, we haven't we haven't covered the future yet. So what what can we expect out of Johnny Archer in the next couple of years? Well, um, I don't really know, but it's going to involve a lot of marijuana. <laughs> no, I, I, I had to take that. That was from uh, That's Joe, the Joe Rogan. Rogan. Where he talked to- <laughs> okay, so let, let's get let's let everybody know I don't smoke marijuana. <laughs> So anyway, just uh, that was just coming from that. Um, That's I don't funny. know. To be honest That's with you, it's going to be. It was, uh, um, you know, I don't know. Just my guess is I'm going to be a, I'm going to be more of a pool room owner. Um, I'm going to still be involved with pool. So um, you never know if I if a couple of my ideas with some team events if it, if we kick it off and it does well, you know, I might be involved in that way. But um, you know, play a little bit here and there. You never know. I might get a little resurgence there before I get too old where I can't stand up. But, uh, you know, you never know. Um, Maybe snap off uh, another turning stone, add to, uh, add to the seventh. Uh, would be, that would be nice. I would enjoy that. Yeah. Well, I'm excited for it, and I'm, uh, I'm really glad that you joined me today, Johnny. I think, uh, I think a lot of the players are really going to enjoy hearing this conversation. Sounds good, man. I hope you guys have a good day and uh, enjoy it. Thanks, Nate. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Okay. Bye bye.
everyone. Thanks again for listening. If you've liked what you've heard and you want to contribute to the future content that will be made, consider joining the podcast's Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash queue it up. Becoming a Patreon of the podcast will help to create all of the future content that the podcast will have. Special shout out to Dave Peters, Aaron Taylor, Pete Silsby, Morgan Lupton, Ben Young, Robert Miller, Andy Morse, and Bill Pelham for your generous contributions to the podcast's Patreon. If you ever need any more information on what the Patreon system is or how you can contribute outside of the Patreon, please reach out to the podcast or Nate himself. If you would like to contribute to the podcast for free, consider sharing any podcasts or the podcast page on Facebook itself. Also, leaving a review and a rating if you listen through iTunes. It helps others find the podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode of the Cue It Up podcast.